the world class airline for us was defined three ways. We want the customer service to be absolutely outstanding. Um, at a level where the customer says, this is what I expected, and I got more than that. Second, we wanted our employees to feel very good about the company. And third, we wanted the shareholders to be very happy. And those were the three tenets. And certainly our goal is in our lifetimes to leave behind in India an air transportation network that uh, we would take a lot of uh, pride in, very really deeply felt psyche about it. And we are very emotional on that issue, absolutely. So. If you look at between 2009 and 15, the company, actually from 2011 in the last five years, the company's generated about one and a half billion dollars. And we have handed out $600 million in dividends, which is a stunning number, especially for a startup and for an airline. And again, for us, badge of honor. Now there's a lot of noise about this dividend thing suddenly in the press, we'll talk about that in a moment, that uh, the words being used are, he stripped dividends out. Um, so we'll talk about that. If you look at India, dramatically underpenetrated market, what these metrics are, they show the seats per capita um, in the United States, very mature market, a uh, lot of mobility, 2.59 seats per capita, in India it's 0.08. But if you look at India, just within the context of the geography that we are in in Southeast Asia, we are a distant, distant last. And it is almost embarrassing where Malaysia can have 1.03 seats per capita and we are at 0.08, which says there's a huge amount of growth potential there. Because of our profitability and because of the way we have been adding capacity, our market share has grown. We don't follow market share. That is not relevant to us. It's profitability. But if you're profitable, your market share will grow. And there is a very big dichotomy here between the other carriers and Indigo, where the others have not been able to sustain this growth like what we have been able to do. We have been, and this was an investor presentation, we heard some backdrop that investors thought we were focusing primarily on trunk routes, and that's where our strength was, myth. We break the airline business that we've operated in into three, group, three groups. One is metro to metro, one is metro to non-metro, and then non-metro to non-metro, which is the three bars on the left. And on all those three bars, if you look at our market share, it's about 40% to 53%. So fairly evenly spread in terms of how we have penetrated the market. And the beauty of this is all three of these segments are equally profitable for us. And then on the right side, we just show the top uh, domestic markets. I'll just make one comment that is not in this slide. It was on a different slide. While we do have this very large market share where we operate, India has about 60 plus airports that can handle an A320 or a 737. We only operate in 32. Again, the philosophy is when you go into a market, build presence before you expand into other cities. So in the next five years, I suspect we pretty much have gone into all 60 or if not 50 cities. So there's huge room for us to grow. In this business, low fare is easy. Anybody can be a low fare carrier. Being a low cost carrier is where the game is played. And if you look at within the Indian context, um, the metric here, by the way, is the cost to fly a seat one kilometer. What does it cost? And we come in at about six cents. The closest is Go Air at 6.37. Privately held company. Some people question how, the, how they account for their numbers. It doesn't matter. This is what they report. SpiceJet is 10% higher than us. And then you have Jet Airways and Air India at a very different level. The one thing I'll point out here if you look at Indigo at 6 cents, 5.95, and then we show something called uh, supplementary rentals, we are very conservative in our accounting, and the aircraft is such a product where after the sixth year or fourth year or eighth year, depending on what product or part of the airplane needs maintenance, there's a major refurbishment that has to happen, and that's that big ticket item, $5 million to replace two engines, maintain it. What we do, we take the monthly cost that we think we will have to end up paying if we accumulated this cost over the months for six years, and we book that expense right away. So six years from now, we will not have a surprise. Like JetBlue got into a massive surprise, and suddenly the analyst said, what the hell happened here? So this is just part of the cost, and you know, who would we kid? It's just owned by us, so who are we fooling? So that's a conservative policy we had in uh, how we did our accounting. Is, is that what airlines typically do, or is it something that? Pretty much most airlines, startups do, not mature airlines. But startups will not book the so ongoing maintenance. The capitals don't require you to do it. India certainly does not require you to do it. Yeah. Um, but 
to our viewers, who are we fooling? You, know, it's, uh, you have to pay the bill ultimately. They also do another, uh, they do a lot of things I shouldn't uh, disparage anybody, uh, because especially we are in a quiet period. They don't do that, but uh, we take this conservative policy. Thank you. Um, not only are we low cost, but uh, here is one part of the strategy that becomes relevant. When we launched the airline, we entered into, I'm just fine, thank you very much. So we did six year leases. The norm is 12 on the low end, high end is 18 years, somewhere in that spectrum, 12 to 18 year leases. Because if you're a lessor, and if a lessee says I want a six year lease, they will charge you more because they're taking the risk of possessing the asset back after the sixth year. Whereas if we take a 12 or 18 year lease, the lease rate is lower. So airlines gravitate towards the 12 to 18 year lease because it's a lower per, per month lease rate. We took a bet that a new narrow body airplane will come out in the market, either Boeing or Airbus will come out. And we wanted to time our first 100 airplanes so that by the time the 100th airplane has come, a new airplane has come, and then these existing airplanes will, in the six year time, will go away from our feet and new technology will come in. We were wrong in terms of a new airplane not coming in, but something very close to it came. We got the A320neo, 10 to 15% lower cost, fuel is 50% of our cost structure. So if you can drop fuel by 10 to 15%, your total cost goes down by 5 to 7.5%. So to the extent we have this cost advantage, we now fundamentally drive our cost down structurally. Said another way, in spite of all of Aditya's brilliance, and I have jokingly said it is a remarkable thing what uh, Aditya and Rahul have done. If he doesn't do anything, we just take these airplanes and the leases automatically come out, our cost will come down 5%. It's just built in. By 2018, a third of our fleet is NEO. So we will have some killer advantages. Now you will hear some competitors saying, but we will also get the NEO or the MAX. They will have to get it from a lessor, and the lessor is going to charge a higher rate. The goal was, can we create a world-class standard and build an airline in India that could take on the likes of Ryanair? If Ryanair was flying in India, can we have a lower cost than them? And that required a lot of very fundamentally different thinking than even what Ryanair does. Now, how do you compare these airlines that are flying in different geographies of the world? The biggest variable that is uh, kind of volatile is fuel. Not only is it day-to-day -day volatile, but different countries have a different charge for fuel, and they have different tax rates. So trying to normalize all that gets very difficult. So we said, you know what, take fuel out of everybody. So if Ryanair operated in India, their fuel cost would be the same as ours. So we just took out fuel cost of everybody, and this is what it looks like. And the banks had a very hard time with this slide. They couldn't understand how an Indian stuff. They kept saying Indian to the point I, I said, I mean, just because we are Indian, it doesn't mean we don't know what we are doing. And we are setting world-class standards. Look at our IT technology. Look at what we do in the biotech sphere. And finally, the Morgan Stanley City, JP Morgan, they started realizing this is something very different. And, and that is what the space does. And for us, this is the holy grail. We must have a lower cost structure on a world level. So if Ryanair came here, we beat them. Now, I pick on Ryanair because they're a gold standard in the business. Ryanair at 2.68 and we at 2.87 or 2.51 if you back up the supplementary rentals. Ryanair benefits fundamentally from the fact they get a huge amount of benefits from the secondary airports they fly. Incentives, subsidies, in India, it's the other way around. Just for the privilege of flying at Delhi airport, you're paying the highest landing fees and access fees in the world. So if Ryanair was to operate in India, their cost would be much higher than this. And it gives us great pleasure and that we were able to get to that point. And going forward, structurally, we will bring our cost down faster than Ryanair can. Ryanair has financed airplanes that will be in their fleet for decades. Hours, six years out, the plane is gone. And there's the other thing that is going on. If you look at our order of 430 airplanes, and I'm not going to give you forward data because the city will come after me, but the 430 airplanes kind of are taken by year 2025. And I think we will again do something different, assuming a new technology. So here is a vision where an airline in India has looked out 15 years 10 years out, 
and made firm commitments. There is no other airline on planet Earth that has a firm aircraft delivery between now and 2020. So, so for us, these are very long, comfortable bets we've taken. From an outsider's perspective, it means that you took a $50 billion bet on airplane orders at list price. We are very comfortable with that. We are scared to take a bet to hedge fuel for one year. We just don't know how that works. That's gambling for us. This has given India, given the product quality, profitability, given the competition, this is not a big bet for us. We still have to execute. So, so you don't hedge fuel costs? We don't. It's too dangerous. Uh, we don't understand it. And those airlines that have done it, some have done well. Many have paid a huge price for it. I mean, experience says long term, over a 10 year period, airlines that hedge have lost money. Worse than we would have It is just a. But do you know what happens if you're publicly held, you have a board, and the board of directors saying, why are you not hedging? After a while, somebody does it, then it becomes a part of the institution till one day you lose $800 million. When United Airlines wrote off $800 million. Emirates wrote off a billion bucks. A million dollars. Emirates, they're in, that's their backyard. A few billion dollars. We don't understand it. We won't take that bet. It's not worth it. Let me just come to the uh, one little thing that I wanted to talk, and we'll talk obviously much more. Dividends. We have been giving dividends very regularly in an erratic quantity. It is not a set dividend. We don't want to come out and be described as a percentage dividend payer because it attracts a different type of investor. We want to say when we have excess cash, it belongs to the shareholder. It does not belong to management, to open club rooms, or doing all sorts of other stuff. Take the money away, they are very focused on continuing to generate money. 2011, $108 million. 2012, we did not issue a dividend even though we were very profitable. That was the year Kingfisher was going down and fares had gone down a lot. We could have issued a dividend, but we said, you know what, there's no need to. Let's see what happens, whether we need the cash or not. Following year, we did 101 million, next year, 63. This year, prior to the IPO, we did 173. And I hear these uh, interesting expressions. No, 158 million. 158, sorry, 173 was in 2015 fiscal, then we did 158. So total we have handed out about $604 million of dividends. Here's a very interesting math. If the IPO happens, and we have a price range of 700 to $765 rupees, it's valued to roughly $4 billion. To have, and $4 billion is today's value. So five years ago, it has to be a smaller value because the company had not grown. But in this period, we handed out $600 million of dividend, which is 15% of the total market cap. For a startup airline, I'd like to see that happen anywhere in the world. You won't find it. When we do the road shows, they ask us, we like this thing, why are you not guaranteeing us dividends? We cannot. Just like in 2012, we said no. And we want to follow the Ryanair model. What Ryanair does is they'll give you a huge amount of dividend, suddenly for a year, year and a half, nothing happens. Then suddenly they'll give a huge amount of dividend. And their shareholders have figured out this is not a kind of a regular pensioner's dividend stock. It is, they will reward me, they won't waste my money. And that's the culture we want in our stockholders. Now, within the Indian press, we've got caught um, <coughs> where you know there is this discussion that goes on that they've stripped dividends off. I thought it was a badge of honor to give dividends to shareholders, whether it's private or public, it doesn't matter. But it's in the category of noise. When we go out and talk to the institutional investors who understand it, all they do is you've taken out 158 million, the value of a company is down by 158. Whatever the multiples are, we take out 158. If we had left 158, they would have added it back. Now, in hindsight, to have avoided that little noise, we might have thought differently, might not have, doesn't matter. But that's kind of where it is. So that's the story, roughly. With that, let's kind of uh, address the questions. You have a situation where the market is growing at 20%. This is before the economy has kind of kicked in, before the Modi government has really started to make things happen. And the economy will kick in. America, where people make a lot of money, Europe, airlines make some money, 
2% growth and they're kind of saying, wow, this is great. Here, I, it is unheard of. So then we said, you know, the models that I personally have used which for tries to understand how much to add capacity, I said, set it aside, it doesn't work. Like, the, I'll show you another number. Delhi Kolkata was another, which was a mature market, or so we thought. Delhi Kolkata in 2011 was nine times for Indigo. Today it is 15 times very profitable market. And so we said, you know what? The market is there. You have to have a good product. You have to be profitable. But there is a dichotomy. Other airlines are not profitable. Indigo is. And we're going to continue to add capacity. What the country will have to also do, not in the next three years, but in some period of time of five, ten years, build runways, airports, open up new cities. The country needs it. The economy is being driven by the middle class. They have more money. And they're now seeing the time value of money. You know, a 10-hour journey, 12-hour train journey versus one hour. Today on the plane, I saw some people, and I'm very certain there's this one couple. This was their first trip. Whoa, the plane lands, and you know, it's still screaming down the runway, and they want to go to the gate to get out. So, and it gives you a great feeling that you know, here's somebody who's traveled for the first time. Another way to look at it, if the growth on the market is 20%, sure, there are some people who are repeat flyers who are flying more, but there is a new element that continues to grow. So this is not going to stop. And if, if you just look at the basic metrics of maybe you should have one seat per capita, and we are at 0.08, we're under tapped. So I think, Rahul Ayaditya, we will be able to fulfill our dream in this lifetime of leaving behind this massive, world-class product in India. Unmatchable. We're doing it in India. We want to put a world-class product. I don't know what we're going to do with the money we have created. That is no longer the motivation in life. So it is a very different issue. It's hard to explain it. The bankers told us. Why are you not doing real estate? Don't want to do it. This is an Indian company. Very simple as that. Sounds real goofy, but such is life. And the advantage is this is our pop stand, you know? This is our decision. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure. We don't take, say, equity, Qatar Airways. Sometimes I call Rahul, Rahul, what company is the company? Well, my shares are still with me, but Qatar keeps saying that they bought us out. <laughs> But it would influence our strategy. It would influence what we want to do. We, we don't want to become a feeder. But Qatar, we love them. They're a great airline, and we're working on a marketing relationship. But we don't need the equity. So very, very focused. 10, 15 years from now, we'll see what we could or should not do. Right now, no. So we face that conundrum. Um, the company is very profitable. We are very comfortably declaring very large dividends. Um, but there's a different issue that comes up. We have about $50 billion of airplanes that we have to acquire at list prices. We won't pay $50 billion. And right now, um, our relationships are good enough where the interaction with the financiers, the leasing market is good, and we don't have a concern on that. But the one thing that does happen is when that uh, leasing company sits in the risk committee, that issue always comes up, but this is a privately held company. And so, so it's food for thought, we think about that. Then, in any company's life, you know, there's a life cycle, the, the initial thinking, the strategy, then the growth, the juvenile phase, and then you're ramping up maturity, and then the decline, which, you know, sometimes these things happen. It is a passage of uh, your kind of rite of passage, if you may, to get that stamp of approval that, yes, we are a listed company. So by getting listed, not only do we have that rite of passage, but we think we should be able to shave a few basis points on our leasing. It won't be a lot, maybe two, three bits, just that. But when you've got $50 billion, it adds up to a lot of money, and we're going to have to play that thing. And, and again, it is that desire, we don't want to leave anything untouched if it will bring our cost down, and as long as it stays with our strategy. On the flip side, 
Um, the government of India, you know, there's a 25% requirement you have to float within three years. Um, and we have tried to do as little as we could because we believe in the company. That's why this 10, 12% float. And we'll see where it goes. But it's a risky business. You know, guarantees in life, but we are comfortable. Um, so there are different types of sweet spots. Um, one is the operational integrity. It is that proverbial 100 to 125 airplane thing where operationally it gets complicated. And there are a lot of things uh, that they are now working on how to address that. I, I, I mean, if you just travel with him once and you just see how many employees' names and how many hugs he gets, you know, it's almost like he paid these guys because he knew we were walking around with him. In the airplane, this flight attendant wants his signature and a little comment. I said, this is it's not a It is just it, today. And, and then he started showing me some notes he gets. I'm like, wow. So, but that culture, after the 100, 120 airplanes, gets harder. We can't afford to lose it. Just like we're driving the cost down, we cannot just say, let's keep this. How do we build on it? So he's got a challenge. He's working on it. <clears throat> there are two types of rewards. Um, and this thing has got... Certainly in the United States, it's got very corrupted, in my view. What nowadays boards do is they give you stock grants. Mm. It's not a stock option. Correct. So five years from now, if you just kept breathing and you didn't get fired, it belongs to you. And that doesn't make sense for the shareholder. So here, it is all options, and the stock has to appreciate for these key people, for these key people to get benefit from it. If the stock stays where it is, they got nothing out of it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And very focused on that. But uh, they're, they're very comfortable, you know, they look at what they're doing. And, yeah. You know, the, the advantage was, I think, as you said earlier, being a private company, does it help you do some things different? Yes. We can do a lot of things which we don't get the influence of five other sage men and women who are pine, and you cannot just say, I'm not going to listen to you. You compromise and you come up with an average solution that has got watered down. In the airline business, well, let me just back up a little bit. Net worth, a, a negative net worth fundamentally happens when any corporation, forget Correct. that, ruining, losing a lot of money. Yeah. Okay. The other reason you can have a negative net worth or a low net, ne, net worth is if you're declaring dividends. That's cash right. that's Those are the only two ends, right? right? In our case, it's not the former, it's the latter. It's the dividends. Latter. Yeah. In the airline business, in the 25, 30 years I've been in it, and I've been in charge of finance also in, in some prior airlines, I have never looked at the net worth of any airline I worked in or a competitor. It's not a factor, but we look at keep it dark, we look at cash flow, we look at depreciation shield, because that is what kills you. If you're running out of cash, it doesn't matter what your net worth is, you're out of business. So the banks, along with the accountants, and now I'm kind of trying to figure out how did we get to this spot? Because we could have done something a little different, and I'll explain to you in a moment. And what the banks did and the accountants did, we have to follow the law. What is the maximum amount of dividend we can declare? They said, OK, here's the number. And they just kept a little safety margin and said, declare this dividend. We have been declaring it every year without looking at net worth. And every year, our net worth is probably skating that line. We just look at our cash flows. We declared it. This press thing hit, what, five days ago? About yes. the net worth? On Saturday. On Saturday. So we got on a call. I said, well, what's going on here? I mean, how does this negative net worth matter? Then the questions are coming. You have stripped the company down. So I said, hang on a sec. If you hand out $100 million of dividend and disclose it, when the analysts do the valuation, they'll do the value on the multiples and they'll subtract $100 million from it. Analytically, there's no other way to do it. If we had left the 100, they will still do it based on the multiple, add back the $100 million. So the bank said, I, we don't also understand. Then I said, okay, I, I apologize. I should know the answer, but I don't know. Can somebody tell me the net worth of Southwest Ryanair Jet Group? Morgan Stanley, Citibank, JP Morgan, silent. Nobody knew the answer. And these are the big bankers. So we'll get back to you. I said, no, no, I need it now. And then I won't name the bank. That bank said, Rakesh, we don't look at it. You know that also. I said, then what is going on? 
So hindsight is 2020. If we had withheld about $20 million of dividends, we would be in positive territory. Mm -hmm. The optics would be different. Okay, it is what it is. I, I want to say 10 other things about it, but because pre-IPO, I cannot. Because it gets into uh, some other issues that, uh, when I was trying to tell the lawyers, this is what I'd like to say, they said, you clearly cannot say those things. So I said, all right, post-IPO, we'll do a little prognosis. Mm -hmm. The financial press understands this. What you just said, they get it. It's another part of the press, and maybe because how Indian promoters have been viewed in an IPO, so we've got tainted with that brush. Eh, you make some mistakes and you learn in life. But having said that, the investment community where we have gone, so here's the other side of it. So Aditya has done 160 or so road shows. I've only done 12 where I was asked to specifically show up. In not one of those meetings did somebody say, why are you declaring dividends? The question always was, why are you not guaranteeing us dividends going forward? And we kept saying, that is our disclosure. We are not going to guarantee it. But they can figure out what this means. And we said, we are good shepherds of capital. That's how you have to look at this business. We are not going to waste the shareholders' money on leather seats and hot food and put ovens and club rooms. We are a short haul airline. We are not a long haul airline. If we are long haul, we have to do a lot of these things. We have big ideas about what we can do in India. We have big ideas. We cannot talk about it. We have to execute it. We cannot promise it. We don't want to promise anything. But we are doing things that we have disclosed, for instance, in our uh, red herring. Like we'll have the A321 that comes in. A321 has 234 seats. 180 seats is the A320. That drops the cost down dramatically. So that allows us to suddenly do different things. The, also, the range of the 321 is bigger. So with the same product, we can fly longer territories outside India. So those are just natural things uh, that will happen. And we have got early slots on those, uh, starting 2018 when the product comes out. We'll just launch it also. A lot of new levers will get pulled. Uh, the 180 seat also, we'll get 186 seats on the new. That will also further reduce our cost structure. Same airplane, just change the way the seating is done. You know, change the backside of the plane and thank you so much. Thank you.